Behaviorism, John B. Watson, History of Psychology, Professor Michael Botlin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno. John Watson said, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed in my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take any one of them at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select, a doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even into beggar man and thief, regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and the race of his ancestors. John Watson is a pure behaviorist and nothing but a behaviorist. He moved psychology from introspection and the study of consciousness stripped out all of the notions of consciousness discussed by the functionalist and moved to make psychology a study of pure behavior. He spent just a few years of his life as a university professor and had to leave academia after having an affair with Rosalie Rayner later moved to advertising, as we'll talk about. But in those scant few years, he changed radically what psychology was about. So here's a little bit about the life and times and the ideas of John B. Watson. Now you might say the B is for broadest, but I say it's John, behaviorist Watson. Bad joke, but about the only one I can come up with right now. Listen to Watson stuff. Watson said, if you could understand rats without the convolutions of introspection, could you not understand people the same way? Watson was a radical behaviorist. In fact, the term was invented for him. Watson wasn't a particularly good student in his early academic career, although he caught steam and became an extremely hard-working person over the course of his life. He was influenced by Angel at Chicago and accepted an academic position as a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He was married three times twice to his first wife, Mary, and then most famously to Rosalie Rayner, who was a student and socialite from the Baltimore area, who was 20 years younger than Watson. Uh, Rosalie and John Watson had an affair while he was a professor and she was his student. He was forced to resign his position at Johns Hopkins because of... After resigning Johns Hopkins, Watson spent some time getting pretty desperate and eventually landed a job in an advertising company where he initially surveyed rubber boot sales uh, east and west of the Mississippi River. Eventually, he moved up in advertising and became an executive at the J. Walter Thompson Company and finished his career at the William Etsty Advertising Company. He went from making, at the time, $600 a year as a university professor to making $70,000 a year as an advertising executive during the height of the Great Depression in this country. His $70,000 salary was roughly equivalent to a million dollars in today's money. Watson was an interesting man. He was charismatic. He was handsome. In fact, Johns Hopkins co eds voted him as the most handsome professor on campus. He was hardworking. 
and he was also hard drinking. He liked to engage in drinking contests with people. He loved driving a speedboat, riding horses, and working on the farm that he bought with Rosalie in Connecticut. Watson believed there were three unlearned emotions in infants, fear, love, and rage. He believed that all behavior is learned, even speech. Uh, this often gets very convoluted when you hear behaviorists talk about what they call verbal behavior. It gets taken to a height with Skinner's analysis of the issue later. He believed personality is simply the summation of your conditioned responses. Not a whole lot to study if you take it from that perspective as a personality guy. And he believed that psychology should be the science of behavior. He published a manifesto called Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. Let's spend a few minutes talking about some of the main points from this manifesto as to what psychology should be. First of all, he looked around and thought that psychology had failed to develop into the natural science he believed it should be. And he thought this was due to psychology's focus on the structure and function of consciousness, which he did not think uh, could be measured in any meaningful and significant way. He didn't even think it was a definable or usable construct. He believed that a behaviorist psychology would be best served by abandoning any delusions about consciousness as a suitable subject for the study in psychology. He faulted introspective introspection, excuse me, as an ineffective and faulty tool that needed to be replaced uh, by something more hardcore. Watson's solution? Psychology must become a science of behavior and not worry about those intermediate things that cannot be assessed in the brain. He believes psychology should have three goals and they should be to observe behavior, predict behavior, and control behavior. Watson is primarily known for his study with Rosalie Rayner of Little Albert, where Albert was conditioned to fear white fuzzy things. We'll talk in length about Little Albert shortly. During a speech in his later years on behaviorism, he inspired Mary Cover Jones to develop the form of behaviorism known as systematic desensitization, which becomes the foundation for today's cognitive behavioral therapy. Let's discuss Watson and Rainier's study of conditioning fear in Little Albert. This is one of the first studies we have where there is documentation both in still pictures and some very early video footage. Let's talk about Watson and Little Albert. Little Albert was afraid of loud noises, as most babies are, and when Watson banged a metal bar with a hammer, it made a loud noise which upset Little Albert. And before the conditioning process and the fear is developed, you can see that Little Albert has no problem shaking hands with a dog. Uh, after the conditioning process, he develops generalized fears of any white fuzzy things, including a Santa Claus mask. And you can see the different kind of inborn fears that little Albert has. 
saw that already. So little Albert is naturally frightened by the loud noise of a hammer striking a metal bar. If we use Pavlovian conditioning terms, the unconditioned response is fear. The unconditioned stimulus is a loud noise striking the metal bar. Watson pairs the fear response with the observation of a white rat. So the white rat becomes the unconditioned stimulus. It's paired with the unconditioned stimulus, which causes Albert the unconditioned response of crying. After a series of pairings, with the UCS and the CS, Albert associates the white rat with fears and the conditioned response happens after he sees the rat. In other words, he cries. Here is a short film with some narration that shows you some of the home movies that were taken of the study. In the early part of the 20th century, psychologists John Watson and Rosalie Rayner set out to teach a baby boy called Little Albert to fear white rats using the principle of classical conditioning. This is a film of their work. The film shows several phases of their study. First, as you see here, the investigators demonstrated that prior to conditioning, Little Albert had no fears of any animals, including, of course, white rats. Watson and Rayner then sought to teach Albert to fear white rats through classical conditioning. In the conditioning phase of the study, which was not filmed, the investigators struck a steel bar with a hammer whenever Albert reached for a rat, making a very loud noise that greatly upset and frightened Albert. After six such pairings of the loud noise and the rat, it was believed that the boy had been conditioned to fear white rats. That is, Albert was now expected to react fearfully to white rats, whether the rats were paired with loud noises or not. In this next film sequence, we see Albert interacting with a white rat after the conditioning process. The investigators believed that the child's reaction during this trial demonstrated his newly acquired fear of white rats. Finally, the investigators expected that little Albert's conditioned fear of white rats would generalise to stimuli that were similar in key ways to a white rat. In this film segment, they were trying to demonstrate that the child now also reacted fearfully to similar objects, such as a rabbit, a dog, a furry object, and a white mask worn by Watson himself.
Here's a pun on the Dos Equis, most interesting man in the world, uh, campaign with Watson saying, I don't always scare babies, but when I do, it's for psychology. Watson also developed an idea that he called act and act psychology. Now, several people have done use the word act over the ages. Act was something that Watson believed was a more molar behavior that involves an organism's movement in space and time. And these response acts basically are goal-directed behavior, kind of motivational things. Examples of response acts, eating, writing, dancing, building something, it can include chained events. But the notion with acts was, since Watson was ultimately a reductionist, any large act <laughs> can be broken down into smaller units of behavior. In terms of emotions, Watson believed emotions could be studied uh, in a different way than James. He believed emotions should be studied as objective stimuli. You need to understand the situation, the overt bodily response, and the requisite internal physiological change. To properly study emotions. He discarded all of James's conscious processes involved in the interpretation of the emotional response. He also dabbled in child psychology and after leaving Johns Hopkins and much later with Rosalie Rayner, he published a book on child psychology although Rosalie rebelled against this a little bit. Watson, and he's been described as his children as being kind of a cold person, uh, he believed, whoa, too fast. He thought children should not be coddled, spoiled, or even hugged and touched. Uh, Rosalie, the father of his, two of his children, uh, didn't like that idea and thought that was a little bit too mechanical and published an article that uh, was contrary to these ideas. Uh, Watson believed that children should be treated as little adults uh, instead of precious pet-like creatures. In terms of his contribution to psychology, Watson brings us not only extreme radical behaviorism, he's a hardcore reductionist and method mechanist. He believes psychology should be the objective science of behavior. He has the laboratories at Furnham University dedicated to his memory as their most famous undergraduate. In intro psychology, we oftentimes define psychology as the science of behavior. If anyone had anything to do with making that the definition of what our field is about, it was John Watson. He had a single-minded notion of what he wanted to see psychology do in the future. The other thing that I think is interesting about Watson is that even though he had to leave academia, he continued to write about behaviorist things, even while working as an advertising executive. So this was something that he held very close to his heart. It also shows that he had some resiliency, he was able to bounce back from the loss of his academic job. So, that's a bit about Watson. In our next few videos, we'll complete our study of the behaviorist and how they've affected the history of our field.
This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael Botwin, all rights reserved.